What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and a brand new video. In this video, you'll see me make this TV stand, cabinet, hutch, console, table, sliding door, cabinet thing, which obviously can be used for multiple purposes. So anyway, in this video, I'll take you through all the steps and show you exactly how I built this. In case you would want to build something like this for yourself, you'll know exactly how to do it. So this build will start off with two sheets of birch plywood. This is three quarter inch veneer and I like to use birch just because it looks really nice. Also it's a little bit lighter than a heavier plywood like oak, but I've just had good results with birch in the past. So the first sheet of plywood is cross cut at 62 inches and then that bigger piece is ripped somewhere around 29 inches which will give us the back and one side piece which I'm cross cutting here which will become the sides of this main frame of the cabinet. So real quickly here is the back and the sides I was talking about which was cut from the first piece of plywood. Here is the second sheet of plywood and this is once again cross cut right at 62 inches and the bigger piece of this plywood will be ripped as you can see me doing in this shot to become the top and the bottom of our cabinet frame. See, here's the top and the bottom pieces. So this build is practically finished now. Okay, so maybe there's still a little bit of work to do. Anyway, with the remaining pieces of plywood, they're all ripped and cross-cut to make the shelves and the inside pieces of this cabinet. And since the shelves can go in different places, there's really no need to use dimensions. You'll just have to lay everything out and measure accordingly to where you want the shelves to go. The frame of this cabinet will be put together using dado grooves on all the plywood panels. And since the panels are three quarter inches thick, I like to cut out half of the depth with the dado. So I use a setup block to mark the blade as three eighths inch high. And then I also leave a three quarter inch gap between the fence and the blade, which will make more sense later in the video. So the first two grooves I cut will be where the top and the bottom of the shelf go. And then the back groove I just cut in that last shot will be where the back panel of the cabinet goes. So one very important tip when using the dado blade to cut grooves for this method of joinery is to make sure that you make all the cuts for one specific groove with the fence in the same place all done at one time. So you don't want to adjust the fence and make multiple cuts in different places and then try to adjust the fence back to where you originally were because even if you get that fence really close, but it's a millimeter or two off, that's gonna throw everything way off and it won't fit together. So the boards I laid out in the last shot will resemble approximately where I want the shelves to go. But the problem is because the shelves are not all in the same spot, I can't just run this full panel across the dado blade because I need that groove to stop halfway. So if I mark how far up the panel needs to go and then I put a clamp on my fence, I can sneak right up on where that groove needs to end and leave the new data groove just shy of coming to that other groove. And here's a very rare shot of me using hand tools instead of a power tool to finish off that groove where I had to stop it shy with the blade. While a little bit tricky to line everything up and get it to fit together, building with this type of joinery can be extremely satisfying when you put everything together and it finally does line up. So on the outside panels as well as the inside vertical panels, I needed to cut more grooves for where the shelves would go. So we go back to the table saw with the dado groove one last time and then just like we did last time we'll put that fence in one spot, cut out the location on all the panels at once so they line up and then I was able to just cross cut the other pieces to length and they would slide right down in those grooves making the interior middle shelves. So 
So if you don't have a dado blade, there is another way that you can make dado grooves. And I'll be cutting out these middle grooves with my router for two reasons. The first reason being that I want to demonstrate the other method of how to cut out a dado groove. And the second reason being I couldn't figure out how to do this with a dado blade and not be able to start the dado blade on the complete end of the plywood. So all you have to do is use a plywood specific bit and a router with a straight edge and that router will go right down the path of where that groove should be making that cut. So you'll need to use a plunge router so you can plunge to the same depth as that groove is, but this is a pretty effective way to make data grooves as well. So with all the grooves finally cut, I wanted to test fit and make sure that everything did fit into place. And then rather than try to measure these panels on the outside and just cut them and maybe be off a little bit, I popped them into place while they were still oversized, marked the end on where they should be, and then I just trimmed them to length afterwards. And look at that, they fit right into place. Oh my gosh, just look at it. To make sure that the outside panels were the same height, I did the exact same thing as I did with those interior panels earlier. Just pop them into place, mark the line, and then they can be flush cut. So after everything was assembled and it finally started to look like a cabinet, I had to take everything back apart. That way I could reassemble it once again, but with glue this time. So whenever I use dado joinery, I like to test fit everything and make sure that it does fit. Because if you just get everything glued together and you get halfway through that glue up and then realize that something is cut to the wrong dimensions, taking that apart to recut it and then put it back together, you will definitely have a mess on your hands. And I know that from firsthand experience. So I try not to make that mistake again. So the frame of the cabinet was complete and now it was time to mill up some rough cut poplar to make the face frame for the cabinet. As far as the milling process goes, we first face joint one side of the board, then joint one edge from the opposite side, from the opposite face through the planer, and then they can be ripped to whatever width is necessary on the table saw. Milling everything up in the way that I just described will make sure that all the boards are the same size, but also all the angles are a true right angle and they'll be much easier to work with this way. So I began laying the top and the bottom piece of this frame on the cabinet, then measured the distance from the top to the bottom, cut those pieces out on the cross cut sled, ripped them to width, put them in place, and then did the same process for the horizontal shelf pieces across the front. Poplar is a really good choice for making face frames with. It's not overly expensive, and it also primes and paints very well. And for that reason, you'll often see poplar used as a face frame in an application similar to this. To join all the face frame pieces together, I'll be using dominoes. So I grabbed a square, made a mark, and then numbered each piece. That way I could stay organized and keep all the pieces in order whenever I had to take them over to the workbench to cut the mortises on. If you're not familiar with the domino, there's a bit that comes out the front that both oscillates and rotates at the same time. And using a gauge on the front, you can line the domino up for very accurate and precise mortises. 
Despite gluing and cutting the panels in the way I did, there were still a couple sections that weren't completely flush, so I trimmed them down using the hand plane. And this is done in preparation to make sure that that face frame will set flush whenever it's attached to the cabinet. On the very bottom piece of the face frame, I wanted a little bit more detail and kind of an elevated look. So I used the table saw to cut a couple angled cuts and then holding that bore down on top of the blade, I could raise the blade and make a recessed cut. Now just a heads up, doing that is a little bit sketchy and if you don't have the board pinned down, then you are just asking for kickback. So if you do that cut, please use caution and just be aware of the kickback risk. With that bottom piece trimmed, I could go ahead and assemble the face frame. So there's a number of different ways you can do this. Like I mentioned, I'm using dominoes. You can use pocket holes, you could use dominoes, you can do dowels. Dominoes seem to work for me, but there are different methods, so you don't necessarily have to use these dominoes. So before the face frame glue dries, we want to go ahead and put this on the cabinet. Now one thing that I didn't mention is whenever I cut the mortises out with the domino, I put the domino on the loose joinery setting. So if maybe I didn't have one of the boards lined up perfectly with the shelf, I could just tap it one way or the other in place to make sure that everything did line up before I clamped it down. Speaking of clamping it down, I couldn't figure out how to apply pressure on the middle pieces, so I grabbed these really fancy clamps that look a lot like dumbbells that ended up working just fine. And while the glue was drying on the face frame and the cabinet, it was time to go ahead and get started on the top. So I milled up some red oak in the same exact manner as I did the poplar with the exception of using the track saw to rip it right down the middle because these boards were just a tad too wide to fit on my joiner. In the past, I've mentioned several times that I don't use dominoes, dowels, or biscuits to glue up tabletops. But if I'm being honest, the last couple tabletops that I've made could have been a lot better, so I wanted to test out the dominoes and see if they helped anything. Now I did run this through the planer after it was done just to make sure that everything was smooth, but using the dominoes here helped this glue up so much and I was able to get everything to stay a lot flatter than I normally have been. One other trick I've found to be useful is to alternate the clamps. So you can see here that I go one clamp on the bottom and then one clamp on the top. And this will help your glue up from bowing one way or the other. I thought it would look better for the face frame to continue all the way around the sides of the cabinet. So I just took some more poplar, cross cut it to length, and then secured it in place using some glue and brad nails. The bottom was a bit trickier because the front of the face frame extended past the bottom of the cabinet. So I just used my digital calipers to measure the spacing, transfer that from the front to the back, and then once again put that in place with glue and brad nails. This dry dex putty is by far the best thing that I've found to use when covering up the holes for brad nails. You don't have to cover up the holes, but it'll look much better if you do. And if you're planning on painting the surface, then you can also use this to cover up a little bit bigger gaps, such as you can see here. And then the next day or a few hours later, you can come back and sand all of that smooth. The excess will be sanded off and that hole or the gap will be filled in with the putty. To make the frames for the doors on this cabinet, I'm using rail and style bits that I got from Rockler. Now I made a previous video on this that goes into a whole lot more detail than what I have time for in this video. And if you're interested in the details, then you can click on the link popping up at the top of the screen right now, which will give some more information. But for the quick version, there are two different router bits that basically create an interlocking joint. 
And that interlocking joint will not only keep these pieces together, but it'll also cut a groove in the middle so that you can slide a panel down in there. That panel that will go in the middle is just a quarter inch sheet of birch plywood that's just glued into place. And this is actually a pretty simple process once you understand how those rail and style bits work. So everything is sanded down nice and smooth and then using the smallest round over bit that I have I detailed all of the edges and then we were finally ready for paint. For the paint I used two coats of primer and then two coats of enamel cabinet paint. Enamel paint in my opinion is one thing that you can use to make everything look that much better. It's also very durable but at least in my eyes I think it looks much better than regular latex paint. The bar and sliding hardware that you see here came from a kit that I purchased and I actually ended up replacing the bar with a different piece of aluminum. But basically you just center the bar laid out across the top of the cabinet and then I used a screw to mark where the holes would go. Next you drill holes for the bolts and then everything can be attached. Oddly enough I don't have an attachment for that bit on my drill. So once again, it was back to hand tools to attach this, and I know what you're thinking. Hand tools used twice in one video. Something crazy is going on for sure. My next video will probably be hand cutting dovetails and doing some hand cut Japanese joinery, but not really. Maybe at some point in time, but probably not in the next video at least. And with the hardware attached to the doors, we could finally make these sliding doors slide. And the gap that you see in the middle is why I replaced that bar. I left that out of the video, but I think you get the idea. Because only the outside portion of that face frame was touching the ground, I wanted to reinforce the bottom of this cabinet. So I just milled up some 2x4 pieces and then attached them to the bottom with screws. For some extra support on the top, I secured some scrap plywood into place, and that's the reason that we left a 3 quarter inch gap in the beginning of the video, so that all of the scrap plywood would fit right down in there and be flush underneath the actual top of this. Speaking of the top, all we had to do now was to finish the top. So it was first flush cut on each end with the track saw, and then I used a round over bit on the top to give it a more detailed edge. The router was followed by some sanding, and then once it was sanded smooth, I finished this piece with Rubio Monocoat Chocolate. And Rubio Monocoat has by far become my go-to whenever I'm trying to finish a really nice piece. It is expensive, but it is incredibly easy to work with and get a flawless finish. Unlike having to do multiple coats of polyurethane with sanding in between, you just apply the Rubio once, let it dry, hit it with some maintenance oil thereafter, and your top is finished. And I think that the color of this top will really complement and stand out against the white of the cabinet base itself. Here is the maintenance oil which ups the sheen a little bit and if you would like some more detail on what exactly I'm doing in this entire process you can once again check out the link at the top of the screen where I will show my technique for finishing Rubio Monaco in a bit more detail than in this video. To secure the top in place I'll be using screws in the front and then expansion brackets in the back. And while you often hear that you can't use screws to secure a tabletop, you actually can as long as you only use screws in one spot where the expansion will occur. So the front of this top can be locked in one place, but then the brackets in the back have elongated holes to allow expansion and contraction across the grain. And then one final thing I did was to touch up the paint on the back of this. So whenever I was painting this, that's where I had the doors for the cabinet. And I want your opinion here on this. So nobody will ever see this and it'll be up against the wall. So is it necessary to finish that? 
or would it be okay to leave that not fully painted since nobody will ever see it? I brought this inside to get some pictures of it and the only thing I had left to do was to put those doors on. So the stopper on the end of the rail comes off and then those doors can just be put into place and you can see here that they slide very easily along the rail for the different compartments to be hidden depending on what is in each one. And with the doors on and sliding as they should, that would finish everything up on this build. So if you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. I had a ton of fun building this type of cabinet. I've wanted to build one with sliding doors for so long, but I just got to the point of where I was confident enough to make this work. So I think it turned out great. I was very happy with the end result. If you can do me a favor and drop a comment down below and let me know what you think of this, it'd be awesome to hear your opinion. Again, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And of course, stay tuned for more.